blessed to be here with y'all this morning, beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Ray Steely. Welcome to First Baptist Lewisburg. Uh, if you're here joining us on the radio, we'd like to say a special welcome, let you know that if you'd like to come join us in person, that uh, we'd be glad to come pick you up. If you'll call the church office at 359-4077, we'll pick you up and take you home. Those of you here that are a guest, uh, for the first time, there's a small pamphlet. I went and forgot it this morning, but uh, there's a small pamphlet supposedly in the back of the pew in front of you. If you'll fill that out, drop it in the offering plate as it comes around. That way we can have a record of your attendance. Or if any of you have some kind of ministry that we, would, that we could help with, prayers, something else, if you'll make a note of that in that little same pamphlet and drop that in, we'll be sure to take care of that as well. Um, I'd like to say thank you on this uh, Memorial Day weekend for those that have gone on before us and protected us and given all for us. We also want to remind you for the one that gave all with no fault, and that's the most important. Uh, so if you would, please join with me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for a beautiful day and being in America and being able to worship and praise you and, and, and in no fear. Thank you for those that protected us and gave everything for us and for our freedom to give us that ability to worship and without having to worry about being come in and picked up and abused and many things that go on throughout the world. Thank you for all those wonderful blessings you give us. We love you and we appreciate them and hopefully we show that on a regular basis. I ask that you open our hearts, open our minds, allow us to hear the message you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you would, please stand. Let's greet and see everybody.
morning again. If you would, uh, we're reading from Luke 7, 1 through 10. So if you'd rise for the reading of the gospel, I'd appreciate it. We are on page 874, if you'd join me in your pew Bible. Luke 7, 1 through 10. When he had concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion slave who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his slave. When they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this, because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, since I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be cured. For I too am a, excuse me, for I too am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Thank you. you may be seated. When two women went to a cemetery in in Vicksburg, Mississippi, to tend to the graves of their fallen loved ones, it, it sort of piqued the interest of some who observed it. When they moved on to another set of graves, and it was observed that they were now decorating and cleaning the, the graves of Union soldiers as opposed to Confederate soldiers, sort of raised their eyebrows. But then the genius of loving all people and honoring all people regardless of anything in their life took hold and became what this Memorial Day celebration is all about. Perhaps you know of someone who went to war and who gave their life in defense of our nation and in support of your freedoms. It's appropriate for us now, then, to just bow and be silent and honor the memory of those who loved country, who loved us, and who gave their all. With your eyes still closed, churches have picked up on this idea of memorial and have begun to associate those who died in faith and to honor their memory on this particular day. I want us to remember and honor Lovell Job, Mrs. Ramsey Sharp, Edna Stacy, Jimmy Crowell, Henry Crane, Jerry Burrow, Freddie Stacy, Michael Cole, Gene Allman, all who went to be with Jesus during this past year. Our Father, for the one who loved us and gave himself for us that he would deliver us from this present evil age, we give you praise and thanks glory and honor, we bow before you with such deep gratitude for the sacrifice that he made that was patterned for all the giving, for all the sacrifice that any 
loving person has ever given. We thank you for those who protected our freedoms, who died on battlefields, who gave their lives in our behalf. We thank you for the cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, who continue to bear testimony to their faith and love in Jesus Christ, and who continue to bear witness to us to continue the journey in faith and faithfulness. And so in these quiet moments of worship, we bow in your presence to thank you for the beauty of such sacrifice as has been given for us. May we feel, may we feel deeply the meaning of what sacrifice has been made for us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Everybody panicked this morning when they read my name beside this. The Wonder of It All. Our hymn of the month, The Wonder of It All, was written by the famous and talented singer, George Beverly Shea, who was with the Billy Graham Crusades for decades. He escaped a life of toil in an insurance office to become a Grammy-winning gospel singer and appeared before an estimated 200 million people at Graham Revival Meetings. Through the Billy Graham Crusades, Mr. Shea was perhaps the most widely heard gospel artist in the world. He also sang at the prayer breakfast of a series of United States presidents, including Eisenhower, Johnson, and George Bush. Of the hundreds of songs he sang, Mr. Shea was most closely identified with How Great Thou Art. In 1957, at a crusade in New York City, Mr. Shea sang it on 108 consecutive nights. He was also known for I'd Rather Have Jesus, for which he composed the music, and The Wonder of It All, for which he wrote words and music. In 1955, Shea was on the ocean liner SS United States en route to meetings in Scotland. A fellow passenger struck up a conversation and asked Shea about the program sequence at the Billy Graham Crusade. Shea responded, I found myself at a loss for words when I tried to describe the responses that usually accompanied Mr. Graham's invitations to become a Christian. I exclaimed to the passenger that what happens never becomes commonplace, watching people by the hundreds come forward. Oh, if you could just see the wonder of it all. As he mused over that thought, Shay was inspired to rough out a melody and write down the words of the song. Seeing men and women come to Christ was the wonder of it all. Please join us in standing and singing our hymn of the month, The Wonder of It All. Wonder of wonders that thrill. 
bow with me, please. Dear Lord, we come to you today excited, praising, joyful, and cheerful. We ask that you accept these tithes and offerings from these cheerful givers and bless them to the things that you need and the things that you would have us use them for. Guide us and direct us. We love you. We praise you. We give to you. Touch each heart. Guide us what to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know you lie on earth was trouble. Only you could know the pain. You weren't afraid to face the devil. You were no stranger to me. So go rest you guys for sharing with us this morning so good I almost forgot it's my turn to get up <laughs> we really should weigh the evidence and do it for ourselves take it in examine it come to some conclusions for ourselves come to a wholehearted conviction concerning Jesus C.S. Lewis argues that Jesus is either a lunatic or a liar, or he is Lord. And there's no middle ground. There's no gray area between the two. He's either what, we, what he says he is, or he deceived us badly. He was a lunatic if he believed he could die and come back to life again, but really could not do that. For those who take that kind of a position who may even use the word resurrection, they'll, they'll think of resurrection as nothing more than a myth. Uh, they may think of it as a fable, or they might really jump on the motivational bandwagon and call it a metaphor for singing the praises of the human spirit, but it's not the resurrection of which Jesus spoke, not the literal rising from the dead that the Bible talks about. If that's the case, then Jesus was a Don Quixote, a man with noble aspirations, but he was a little bit off. Does that do justice to who Jesus is? He's a very non-threatening Jesus, if he's that Jesus. 
He was a liar if he claimed he could impart forgiveness of sins to and, and give eternal life, but in fact, he could not bring anybody into a saving relationship with God. In fact, he was a liar if he talked about a relationship with God that did not even exist or that he could not even have. But if he died on a cross for the sins of the world and he was raised from the dead, he is Lord of all. I guess you wonder, which of those positions am I going to advocate today? Well, I hope you're with me. I really do think we need to take it seriously and examine the evidence and come to some fitting uh, commitments to the truth that Jesus is Lord. That kind of a dramatic, emphatic conviction is very much needed but in short supply for the world in which we are witnesses. I crafted that sentence very, very carefully because I want us to feel the, the weight of the truth that it bears, that we are witnesses to our world, but we may not be the bold and daring and committed and deeply convicted witnesses that we need to be, that this world around us needs to have. I mean, do you believe that if someone dies with, with real faith in Jesus, that their, their final state will be one of, of uh, blessing and joy forever? Or do you believe that if someone dies without real faith in Jesus, their final state will be agony and torment and separation from God in hell? forever? That's what the Bible talks about here. And you can't gloss over that and dismiss it and pretend like final conditions are not real. And nearly everybody in this room, I believe, would have the hope that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Amen? Amen? Because you have faith in Christ, and for no other reason, not because you've been good enough to get there, but because you've trusted in him who loved you and gave himself for you, died on a, on a cross. But if you realize that you could die and spend eternity separated from God and in hell, could that person be you? It's a good question, isn't it? Sobering question. Will you open a Bible with me this morning to Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12 is what I'll read this morning, page 989 in your pew Bible, Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, the introductory sentences for the letter that Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia, would you please just follow along as I read uh, the word of the Lord for today, and then keep your Bible open because you'll see the connecting points along the way as we talk. Paul, apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. 
For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's bow together. Our Father, tough passage of Scripture, pretty sharp, pointed, directed deep to the heart within us and calling us to give an honest assessment and response to the evidence that you put before us. We thank you that you spoke a word that will never be shaken, that will never be found to be untrue, but will be completely reliable and will, will safely guide us into an eternity to live with you forever. We thank you for this good news of Jesus Christ. We celebrate it today in this place of worship. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There are a couple of issues that are unfolding here in this opening of Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. Um, Paul begins, and, and often, in, in, I think in most of his letters, he, he has a, a time of, of uh, defending his apostleship, defending the ministry that he has taken, and especially against those who would criticize him for the way that he carries out his ministry or for, uh, against those who would deny that he even has a, a divine commission from God. But I assure you that, that this issue of calling and fulfilling one's ministry is a burning issue for every minister of the gospel in the present moment. Uh, Paul asserts his spiritual authority to proclaim real good news and to call people to hold fast to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That's one thing that's taking place here. Paul sort of subtly, though, and implicitly, challenges spiritualities that are alternative to Christian spiritualities. Now, I don't think we're going to have time to talk about that second thing uh, today, the challenging alternative spiritualities, but any one of us in this place would know that there are numerous alternative spiritualities to that which is expressed for us in the scriptures, and that to which Paul refers when he talks about this gospel that if anyone tampers with it, uh, they would become accursed uh, for that. So we're going to just kind of leave that one in the background, but let's, let's talk about Paul's spiritual authority to proclaim the real gospel. A Native American was walking along a busy New York street, and I don't know any New York street that's not busy, not noisy, not crowded with people. It's an amazing kind of thing that this Native American is walking along a busy street with a businessman, and suddenly he stopped in his tracks and he said, listen, do you hear it? There's a cricket. There's a cricket nearby. And the businessman said, are you crazy? In all of this noise, you hear a cricket. I mean, buses making noise and horns honking and people talking. And, you know, the city is really, really noisy. And here's this guy. Said, I hear a cricket. Well, who would care if you heard a cricket? <laughs> the Native American said, yes, there's a cricket. There's a cricket nearby. And I, I hear it chirping. And so he began to look around and, and to kind of sift through some of the stuff on the street and he finally came to a place and he said yeah there it is and he reached over and picked up the cricket and he showed the businessman yes there's a cricket and the businessman was a little bit amazed that he could could hear it and so he asked the question how do you do that how did you know that there was a cricket there and the the native american reached into his pocket pulled out a handful of change and then he just sort of tossed it on the on the sidewalk there now, imagine hearing the clinking of coins on the sidewalk in a busy New York City. Twenty people stopped dead in their tracks when they heard the clinking of the coins on the sidewalk. And the Native American said, you hear the sound of coins because you're tuned into money. I hear the cricket because I'm tuned into nature. Okay, it's a good little illustration to suggest something to us that, that we hear what we listen for, what we're tuned into, that's, that's what we hear. And, and th that's true for us in this place today. I mean, uh, and, and in this setting, as I proclaim this word, as I expound this passage of scripture, some of you are going to hear some different things than what other people are hearing. And some of you will not hear at all what I have to say. Um, 
Some of you hear what God is saying because you're tuned in to the still, small voice of Jesus. You've been trained to do that. You've, you've, you've been taught that the Bible is an important part of, of your understanding of what God's will is and what God's purpose is and how God speaks and what, and, and you've used the Bible in your life to discern God's will for your life. You've been taught that, and so you, you're tuned in to the voice of the Lord. You hear the still, small voice of, of Jesus because you've, you're so familiar with the scriptures. But many of you rarely hear the still, small voice of Jesus because you're listening to a cacophony of voices. Cacophony, I, I lost some people there. Uh, cacophony means a lot of sound whole bunch of different noises. I mean, you're listening to friends who have neat things to say to you about stuff. You're especially tuned into social media and the media in general. Popular entertainment passes messages on to you. Isn't it wonderful how Hollywood has become so politically astute for the public today? how subtly those messages come across in the movies that we see and the stories that we see on TV. Your favorite politicians, yeah, their, their voices are saying what you want to hear or saying what you don't want to hear. Your enemies, you may be listening to your enemies more than your friends. You may be listening to other people. Because at base, at heart, you are a people pleaser. You want to do only what people are pleased with you doing. So you, you rarely hear the still, small voice of Jesus because you're listening to so many other things more than to the voice of Jesus. A few of you will never hear the still, small voice of Jesus. Because you've never decided to listen to the still, small voice of Jesus. You've never decided to take seriously his word and his ministry and what he did for you. You've never decided that that's the most important thing in your life. And until you do, you will never really hear the still, small voice of Jesus. Because you may have substituted the true gospel of Jesus Christ with another gospel that is not a gospel. It's a different gospel, and it's not gospel. It's not even fair to call it gospel. And you'll never, never, you won't ever hear the still, small voice of Jesus. And you know there are big-name guys out there preaching a different gospel that is not gospel. And to the degree that you embrace that stuff, you diminish your ability to hear Jesus. You know, all that we have to offer to a world of people who are lonely and, and looking for lasting relationships, they're searching and they're desperate. You know, most of us feel a deep, deep loneliness. There's a... a, a Put your head on the pillow at night, even if there's someone beside you, it's desperately lonely. It can be. The only thing we have to offer is uh, a community that gathers to Jesus. A fellowship that is built upon the person of Jesus who is at the center of it all. The, that's all that we, have to, that we as a church have to offer the community around us. Because what the world needs more than anything else is real relationship, not just with each other, but real relationship with the living God who created us and who redeemed us and who invites us to come and inhabit his, his heaven forever. That's all we really have, have to offer. And that's an amazing thing. Uh, a man recently became a Christian, and uh, he was talking with a guy named Nicky Gumbel, and he said, I came from a conservative Christian background, but I threw it all overboard because the unspoken message of the church where I was was first I had to behave, then I had to believe, and if I was lucky, then uh, they might let me belong. 
behave, believe, belong. Now, let's be honest. Do we harbor some of those attitudes? Do we look with suspicion upon some who show up for our worship service? In my first church experience as a 20-year-old, I had long hair, and patched up blue jeans, and I wore sandals. In those days, it was a scandal. Are you wearing sandals today? I sat in the back of the church. It was the safest place for a guy like me to be. And even though there were some in that congregation that viewed me suspiciously and I felt the distance and all of that stuff, eventually that congregation came to welcome me and embrace me. And that was the place where I first heard God speak to me about calling me to ministry. That was the place where I was baptized. That's the place where I got married. That was the place that, that shared in so many beautiful experiences of life because they didn't let my behavior keep me from becoming a part of who they were. They didn't make that the main thing. If you expect folks to clean up before they come, then they're not going to feel welcome when they come here. But if we embrace them as they are, the new pastor of a church uh, came and uh, and he dressed up in shabby clothing and you know and he and he walked down the aisle. the uh, The previous guy was finishing out his ministry there. The new guy was going to start next day, but he came and sat down on the on the floor because there were no seats left on the floor in front of the pulpit down there where you know everybody could see him. And everybody was going, you know, at a high church, Presbyterian church, you know. That was a scandal, a scandal. And before the service really got off the ground, an elderly gentleman dressed in really fine clothing and carrying a, a cane began walking down the aisle, and you hear the, you know, as he's moving down the aisle and putting that cane on the floor. And he came down and he sat down on the floor with the disheveled looking guy. And the disheveled looking guy shook his hand and said, Hi, I'm your new pastor. <laughs> <laughs> they behave, believe, and maybe you get to belong. That's the bane of a lot of churches in our world today. Gumbel, when he heard the guy say that, realized the man was on to something here. He, was, he, was, he inferred that there's the makings of some very profound but simple theological insight there in, in what the guy was saying because he's talking about his experience and a lot of good theology comes out of personal experience. He thought Jesus definitely received and welcomed all kinds of unclean people. In fact, he spent more time with the bad people than he did with the good people. In fact, one of the criticisms of Jesus is that he was more often found to be with sinners than he was with the saints. And the amazing thing about it was that he carried his holiness in such a way that the sinners felt absolutely comfortable with him. He welcomed them. He went to them. He interacted with them. Gumbel realized that really is the way that Jesus did. He drew people to himself because he accepted people just like they are. Not to leave them just like they are, but he accepted them just like they are. So now Gumbel challenges this model, this, this way of, of behave, believe, and maybe you get to belong kind of a theology. He says, first, give seekers a sense that they belong, that they're welcome." That this is a place for them, that we're really excited and happy to be their friends. Not because we want to manipulate them into joining us, but because we're genuinely concerned for them. We love people. We love people like we love each other. Well, that's, that's a truth in another sermon, but, 
but we love. Jesus said, this is the way that all people will know you're my disciples, that you love one another. So, yeah, give those folks a sense that they belong. There's nobody who's a second-class citizen here. There's nobody who has, like the cream, risen to the top. We're all equal before God here. Amen? Once, you, once they belong, once they feel this, this belonging here, then, then pray that they come to believe. Now, I like how Gumbel put that because it, it, it struck me as being so deeply wonderful and profound that the way to go about doing anything spiritual, doing anything different, changing anything about the life of the church begins with prayer. And without prayer, it's not going to happen. I'm convicted of that and shared that, that thought with you. And I, I'm, I'm reminded, and I just read this guy, and he says, yeah, pray that they come to believe. Because nobody in this place has the power to convince anyone to believe a spiritual truth that only God can make known to them. But why wouldn't we pray that people come to faith and that they believe and that they give their lives and devote themselves to Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't we ask the Holy Spirit to work in a person's life to create this thing? Why would we depend upon ourselves? Why would we even think that we would have the wherewithal to do something like that in a person's life? At the very best, we're, we're a glove with a divine hand in it. Let's pray that all of us are regular that we all believe, that we all trust, that we all commit to Jesus Christ, and then model and teach them how to behave. See the reverse? Reverse? It's, it's now... Belong, believe, behave. That makes better sense, doesn't it? That makes better sense. Because it's the way that Jesus affects all of us. Now, that's, that's to say, proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Not by telling them how good they really are. I heard you laughing, Paul. <laughs> Not by promising them that it is their right to have material wealth and physical health. That is not anybody's right. Did you know that? But there are some who make that promise. Not by omitting the Jesus demand that we must deny ourselves and take up our crosses if we're going to follow Jesus. I've been taken by re reading the, the account of Paul's conversion and leading up to his conversion and all of the letters. In all of the letters, Paul refers to the suffering that comes along with being a Christian, with, with being on the mission field as he was. And I realized, I, didn't, I never made the connection before, but Paul was a persecutor of the church. He often reminded the people, I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. And he said, you know what? Suffering as a Christian is not an option. That deep within your commitment to Jesus Christ is this suffering. He said, I used to afflict on the church. Yeah, so let's, let's not pretend that that's not real. Let, let, let's not pretend that it's all sunshine and rainbows and butterflies and warm, fuzzy feeling. Let's talk about a faith that is so commanding and so demanding it's worth our putting everything that we have into it. Amen? See, that tampering with the gospel when you change the gospel of Jesus Christ into something is not. That tampering with the gospel is what Paul says deserves a curse. And this is no light word for a curse here. A curse means 
Anathema, that means, that means forever shut out. <laughs> that means, that means, well, I don't want to use the word that came to my mind here. It's bad. It's really bad. Such tampering with the gospel. Just remember, Christ died for your sins and was raised for your justification. That's the gospel. Man was walking through the woods with a friend. His mouth was dry, so he licked his lips. Big mistake, right? As he licked his lips, his lips became chapped. So the more he licked, the more his lips chapped. The more his, lap chapped, his lips chapped, the more he licked. And you see the never-ending process that goes on here. And he complained to his friend about the problem that he's having, and his friend said, this is how we handle chapped lips out here. He said, rub some horse manure on your lips. <laughs> and the man said, are you crazy? What will that do for me? That sounds like the people who come to church. What are you going to do for me? You know, okay, that's another thing. Okay. What will that do for me? The friend answered, Horse manure does two things for you. One, it soothes the cracks on your lips. And two, it discourages you from licking your lips. <laughs> well, there's a, that's gospel, isn't it? As distasteful, oh, I love this. This, this, this is pun is intended. As distasteful as it is. <laughs> Come to grips with the fact that you are a sinner. Nobody likes to admit that. Nobody likes to deal with that reality. Nobody wants, them, uh, wants to be told that about you, about yourself. Very few people want to think about that reality. The fact of the matter is, all of us have sinned. We all presently have sin in our lives. Everyone in this place, right here, right now, as distasteful as it is, come to terms with that fact. But know that you need forgiveness. Know that you need forgiveness. God's forgiveness. Above anybody else's forgiveness, you need more than anything else. God's forgiveness in your life. That's that's a good place to begin. Know that that's your greatest need. That's the first, primary, most important need that you have to uh, meet in your life. You need God's forgiveness. And believe that you can be fully forgiven all of your sins. All of them. Past, present, future. That's hard for some to imagine that even the sins you've not yet committed can be fully forgiven by God, but that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. All of our sins can be forgiven because Christ died on the cross for us. He took our place. Rejoice that God himself transforms forgiven sinners into saints. And only he you can't change your life. He can do it. And until he goes to work on you, until you let him do that work, you'll be just what you always have been. You'll do just like you always have done. But rejoice that he can transform your life. Confess your faith publicly. Jesus never called anyone to a private devotion. It's important as a disciple to have private devotions, to be sure. But Jesus called everyone who put their faith to take a public stand. In the Baptist church, we use baptism for making such a public confession. In the Baptist church, we invite people to come forward and say, I have trusted Jesus. I trust him as my Savior, and I submit my life to him as Lord. That's a public confession of faith. And that's a good thing. It takes a lot of courage to do that, right? 
to identify with who Jesus is and what he's done for you in our world it takes a lot of courage even in a fellowship like this. But Jesus calls us to make that public confession of faith. But finally, if you're going to embrace this gospel, this real gospel, this true gospel, this untampered with gospel, prepare to follow Jesus all the way. Don't just go until it gets hard. Keep going when it gets hard, and it will get hard. Just prepare your, your mind and your heart and say, if I commit my life to Jesus, I'm going to go all the way. Start with that determination right up front. Don't wait for a second opportunity or for a second something to happen in your life that will convince you that you could give yourself a, uh, you could commit yourself at that other time. One of the fallacies of, of my early church experience was that my pastor distinguished the uh, call to become a Christian from the call to service. And there were a bunch of us that he taught that we should commit ourselves to full-time Christian service as if it was something separate and distinct from our, our call to salvation. But if your salvation began before the foundation of the world, and it really did, and if you are God's workmanship who were created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them, your call is in place the moment you say yes to Jesus. And if in this very moment you find, I'm not doing what Jesus called me to do, then drop whatever it is you're doing and get on board with what he wants you to do. Not all of you are called to become pastor of a church or a minister of music or go to the mission field. But what God has called every one of us to do is equally as important as any of the most visible kinds of forms of ministry that we're you're doing something else drop it and just go with the call that was embedded in your salvation when Jesus took hold of your life prepare to follow Jesus all the way well, that's the gospel that's the gospel that's what Paul proclaimed with divine authority behind it that's the word I deliver to you. And I desire that everyone in this place, everyone here who's, who hears the sound of my voice, will respond with faith, simple faith, in this wonderful Savior who lays claim to the whole of our lives. Will you now? Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that those whom you have called will respond with faithfulness, with urgency, with desire to be fully pleasing to you in every way. Grant the gift of repentance and faith and the gift of eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ to anyone in this place who says yes to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Close my eyes and hold my heart. Cover me and make me something. Change this something normal into something.